Assess sound and data. Uh, so, Ivana, why don't you introduce yourself and to the sound and data channel listeners? Okay, and, uh, okay. Your perspective on you know what, what yeah. we, should, we should talk about. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I grew up in India, and um, uh, my parents were like uh, very, very variable characters. And uh, my both my parents were professors. One taught um, English and German. The other taught. Uh, mathematics and um, they had variable music tastes as well and then I moved here and um, I kind of carried a little bit of them with me Um, both had disappeared from my life by then you know both had passed away and when I came here I I I kind of started writing and my 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 return to creativity started with writing and um yeah i noticed that then, your first degree is in uh, english literature right yes uh-huh. yes and what part yes. of india as long as just to out of curiosity um so my my mother was from the north which is kashmir yeah yeah and and my father was from the east which is bengal uh-huh yes yeah. so um but however my mom was kind of raised by an irish divine mother who lived uh-huh. with us Oh. So I had kind of like a very variable music taste. My father's family, we lived in a very large family of aunts and uncles and everybody. So my father's family, um, they were into classical Indian music. So every one of them played one instrument or the other, you know, a large uh-huh. family, uncles and aunts. My pa- uh, father even played an instrument and percussion. I would wake up to the buzzing drone sounds of uh, tanpura, which is like a long-necked, plucked string instrument, you know, played just for harmony. Right. And with its large uh, spectrum of overtones. And then I would smell the jasmine flowers (laughs) right next to my window. And um, sometimes a street bard, you know, singing folk songs. Um, this was inevitably followed, uh, you know, by a rustle of newspapers. For my dad was always a early morning crossword solver. <laughs> so it was kind of like a mix of sense, sounds, texts that I woke up to. However, my primary interest was in percussion, you know, the tabla, which was the Indian drum. Sure. And I was also, like, I had a very good sense of rhythm. I was told by my parents um, that I shouldn't try to sing because I didn't have an Indian voice to sing. (laughs) And I kind of like wrote that off my chart of things to do in life. And then I started doing theater. I was a real theater person for like 10, 12 years. Uh, What form of theater? Like Eugene um, O'Neill and that kind of stuff? No, just any kind of theater, you know, all kinds of languages, you know, Indian languages, English. Uh Uh-huh. Um, and any kind of theater, I was passionately into theater, you know, and dance. So that dance and theater, the writing I carried here till once I came here, I decided, you know what, I should try writing some lyrics, you know, and that's when I joined Berkeley College of Music, you know, the online courses. Right. And online, I, I did a, like a three year course. Um, with various professors. However, one professor, um, Mr. Shane Adams, he was my kind of mentor, I could say. I'm very grateful to him, you know, for whatever he uh, groomed me into, you know. And he let just let me just be, you know. I was kind of like a rebel. I wanted to learn the rules and break them, so <laughs> he allowed me to do that, you know. Uh-huh. And, and um, after that... My actual process of writing and thinking and thinking that what is sound, what is what is art, and how these things could to go together started when um, we moved to Cambridge, and I was homeschooling my son. You know, and uh-huh, yeah, I homeschooled my kids too, so I'm familiar with. Oh, that. you did. Yeah. Well, oh, wonderful is that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So I homeschooled my son, and he was kind of like very young when we came here. 
and uh, started taking him to MIT, some various, you know, courses at MIT. Right. And while he had a mentor by then, you know, who was grooming him to apply to college, he found a mentor, Just he just came in his life. And thanks to that mentor, I got some time of my own, you know, uh -huh. um, to, to merge with, with what is technology, something that I wasn't at all interested in when I was in India, uh, what is science, and I started seeing, hearing, smelling, uh, singing science, science in a span of two years um, through literature, you know, and through music. And it's okay. kind of a difficult thing to explain. Yeah, yeah. right. I was going to go. I didn't quite get that part, but go ahead. That's interesting. Yeah. So I would, it started with me just writing uh melodies and songs based on a lot of research that was going on at MIT. You know, I met a lot of professors, scientists, scholars. They were very open and they allowed me to delve into their research, understand from my perspective, not from theirs, because I was not qualified. Right. Um, so from my perspective, from a metaphorical, from an uh, from a perspective of illusions, you know. Mm -hmm. And um so I was kind of sculpting space with sounds you know so to speak you know so for instance if i heard um, the sound of the atm you know at mit or you know the recycling bin or even a sound of a plopping you know it translated to a dot a circle a sphere a nothingness you know and then i connected them to memories and which connected again to a rhythm so it was kind of always a back and forth a melody or, you know, a phonetic fragment. So then I started writing this journal, you know, I'm like, okay, I should write the process of what's happening. And it became a, a kind of stream of consciousness journal. You know, it was like, I just wrote what I felt, uh -huh. not what it was supposed to be grammatically and f format wise correct. You know, I just wanted to be myself, you know, for a change. Um, so that's how the process started. And then I came about to uh, finishing this whole project in the span of like five and a half years. Um, turned out to be a, like a 460 page book with um, illustrations. I also draw a little bit. Um, and um, the illustrations were, however, made graphically by my student from India. Uh -huh. And so she did the graphics. I wasn't trained to do the graphics. What's the, what's the title of the book? It's called A Square and a Half, The Colors of Sounding. I just released it. You know I, we, you know what, um, uh, Scott, I think I should send you a PDF copy of that. Sure. Yeah, that would be great. I saw the yeah. press release about it and read that, but I, I didn't. Uh, I'm still trying to make the connection between how that influenced, I mean, how data itself influenced the sounds of your music. Yes. So, for example, um, as I was saying, I grew up, you know, um, in this place where I, it was always a mixed influence. Right. So, uh, for me, sound is the means by which I kind of sense a transmission of information or knowledge uh -huh. it could be spoken or unspoken i i kind of well, know one of the things you shared with me was this sort of sense of the acoustical spaces particularly the sound of the bird in that large large architectural uh setting yes. uh yes. which kind of was a way of experiencing an acoustic space by way of a digital recording yes yes so uh, I would ask myself, what is a void sound like, you know? And I would go to Killian Court at MIT and just stand there. And uh, I would feel for the first time, you know, uh, in my life, uh, colors and sounding sounds fusing in my experience. You could say it was automatic, almost in, involuntary, you know? Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, one afternoon, I, I I saw these green edges in a fragment of my memory as I was standing there. And every memory for me had always a sensation and sound. It's just that I couldn't ever articulate it or didn't find the need to articulate it. And that happened to me 
strangely through sci reading scientific articles and I would sense something. I would sense a memory. It's, it's very hard to explain, you know, unless you read the book or you kind of like go through the book. But I'm going to try and make it and summarize it as much as I can. So, for example, green to me suggests the scent of like an unripened green lemon. And this in turn brings to mind some lines from a novella by D.H. Lawrence, you know, who always influenced me in my perceptions in literature. Mm. And I think the lines were, I may not be totally correct, um, a cold, blossomless, resinous sap, surging and oozing gum from that pallid brownish bark, and the wind hissing in the needle, needles uh, like a vast nest of serpents. So I have a quirky mind, which tends to store like a, a <laughs> lot of thoughts, yeah. <laughs> sensations in an imaginary basket, so to speak. So I, I would take that information and then translate that into some kind of like a synthetic sound in my, you know, I, I use just a simple, um, you know, system at, for making sounds at my place. And well, what would uh, that be? What's the simple system? Uh, I use sonar. Oh, okay. Sonar. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that, that was what was suggested by Berkeley, and I just stuck to that because I'm kind of old school and I'm not very good with technology, strangely. Um, so fine. I stuck to that. And I would uh, write uh, the music and then send it to um, a cellist, you know, uh -huh. uh, who's a friend of mine. Now he's back in Israel. He's a very good cellist. And he would create the cello um, parts of the songs for me. And I would just sing on the spot, never re-recording the songs, uh, never deciding the melody you know, it was kind of kind of like a chance music, you know, for me. Uh -huh. Like it was just like on the spot, whatever I am thinking, I translated to music. So it, it extemporized like, like the writing, sort of. Yes, yes. It was always like chance based, you know. Mm -hmm. So um I think my interest in sound as an art form naturally grew after I heard Laurie Anderson's Sharky's Night, you know. Mm -hmm. And that is when I heard, and then I thought maybe sound as an art, as me being a kind of like a, a strange, fragmented writer, <laughs> um, could be this, you know. And that is when I heard William Burroughs, who read out the lyrics, you know, in Sharky Side. Right. And, and I also learned about, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, Brian Geisen. Yeah, Brian you know? Geisen, that's right. Yeah, and that's when I first heard, it must be about 10 years ago, that's the first time I heard about him. Uh -huh. And, and um, apparently Guyton and Burroughs met in Tangier, and then they had this chemistry in Paris, you know. Right. And I was intrigued, mostly not in much of, I didn't read much of uh, much about Burroughs and Guyton. I was intrigued by Guyton's magical, almost mystical, Cut up technique, you know, a technique of randomly collaging texts. Right. And that is kind of the technique that is used in my storybook. And he, al my he also, uh, Geisen did that musically. He used uh, the same sort of cut up techniques to construct musical stuff. Yes, and that's what I kind of hazily read. I'm, I'm, I'm being honest. I don't no, know that's much. Right. Yeah. yeah, so um, I, I can't. I, I think he said that if you have a new poem and, you know, you just select the passages and fill a page with the excerpts, as many pages as you like, and then visit your memories and your dance and your voice, you know, and look for a harmonic uh, strain. And the green skies are open and there's perfume and, the, uh, and through the great skies, you hear the bugle burning flesh children to mist you know something like that yeah right i mean and, they, they yeah. are known for that uh, dream machine you know the sort of self-hypnosis uh, yes. light thing that that induced these states of hypnagogic uh, you know both music and poetry actually yes and i was totally uh, mesmerized by that you know yeah and <laughs> 
That's the right <laughs> term, I guess, to mesmerize. <laughs> Absolutely, you know. And I'm trying to kind of like, it's it's either, you know, what I write or what I do, people either love it or they don't know what it is and they're like, okay, it's fine, you know. So there is no middle way with what I do and I'm fine with that because I'm kind of like weird and I'm trying to let that weirdness <laughs> go out there. Um, well, there was there was one other topic that that caught my interest, just sort of you know preparing to talk to you and stuff, and that was the stuff about cryptography. Uh, yeah, you were referring to your son uh, had done some work uh, with, but then you made this reference to uh, Joyce in one of your Facebook posts that that intrigued me because. Uh, well, I don't know. Do yes, you, uh, yes. So is that relevant uh, at all, or? Uh. Yeah, because his his study in cryptography is completely different from my very very little understanding. You know? Yeah, <laughs> he goes right. to MIT, and I I have no idea what he does. You know, he's a mathematics student, mm. and um, I don't know anything. He just tries to simplistically explain, and I get like wonder eyed and I take the little information that I get and from there I get you know kind of like a sy systematic derangement of the senses you could call it yeah yeah wow. <laughs> you know and um, it's like a cut up you know and I take these words and these and the information and I, I know that Joyce was interested in like secret writing you know and I don't know where that he got that from but and that's all I knew knew about cryptography before my son started taking it. You know, <laughs> at school classes. You know? Yeah, right, right. And, well, that's an interesting angle on cryptography. That's for sure. I mean, the yeah. other thing is like George Antale and Hedy Lamarr uh, uh -huh. making that uh, device for s shooting torpedoes that has ended up being the way the cell phone works, which is cryptographic and it's channel skipping. Uh, technology that that they sort of patented and is a big part of the way cell phones work now uh wow. but but it's coming from this art place i mean uh, antel was a bad boy of paris and did a lot of stuff with uh you know player pianos and hedy lamar you know was a famous movie star it's very you know wow. so so um this place between art and science always you, a lot of times comes from the science space, but what I'm hearing, what you're talking about is like, well, let's come from this dream space into something that, that makes sense relative to science. Yes. So it was always, you know, it's very strange thought. I have to admit, I never, my, my father was a very good mathematician and he was really sick of me kind of just barely scraping through math classes, you know. <laughs> And and I never showed interest in science or math. And I know the reason why, with due apology to the Indian education system. You know, our literature is amazing because we follow the British system. But our mathematics and sciences kind of too, um, too bookish, you know. And uh -huh. there was nothing that the sparked the interest, the imagination. You know, it was just a black and white book which didn't color my senses. And I had to be colored in the senses somehow to write, to sing, to think, uh -huh. and to imagine, you know? Yeah, and MIT did yeah. that for me. MIT did that by, from the spaces to the research. Um, you know, if, if I can, oh, you know, open my book and I, I'll, I'll send you my book and maybe that would help you understand it a yeah, little no, better. Right. I'm, I'm getting a sense, yeah. And uh, it was like, you know, for example, I would pick up like, a, 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 you know, a science um, journal that the undergraduates publish called the Merge, M-U-R-J. And, you know, and I would find an article there, you know, and I found an article by, you know, uh, Dr. Lars Chitka, you know, um, False Memories in Bumblebees. And um, that was like, that absolutely sparked my interest. <laughs> and, uh, Very poetic, and, actually. <laughs> yeah. And it was cognitive science. And he's writing, he, Lars has currently written a book himself. Mm. And his writing was so beautiful, so easy to understand. And his research was explained in the most simple manner that I've ever read, science research. 
you know, so I kind of started communicating and we had a two year communication just on emails, you know, uh-huh. and because Lars is not from here. Lars is from the University of um, uh, the, the Queen Mary University of London. Uh-huh. And he's the founder of the Research Center for Psychology there. And he and I swapped a friendship, you know, and I, I kind of like, and then started making music together because he plays the guitar as well. So um, I, I read his, reread his paper, the, the False Memories in Bumblebees. And this, and my imagination was not, of course, relying on facts or logic, you know. It yeah. was more of an illusion. It, it's more like an invisible laughter, you know, cutting through the wings of, of the sun, you know. And and getting strangest of memories, you know, just sparking through my brain. Because, again, I, I went back to cut-ups, you know, like a collage of words, you know, heard or senses heard, you know, or senses translated through words or through sounds. Right. So um, I know in India, synesthesia is considered a folly. Oh, really? That's, yeah, it is. It's okay. actually, I mean, there's two sides to synesthesia. One is sort of aesthetic, but the other one is actually pathological. I mean, there's absolutely people that hear colors and that kind of stuff as a as a physiology kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So I kind of like, I regained that confidence. I forgot, you know, all my inner voices that told me that this is right, this is wrong. Mm. Because in MIT, everything was possible. In MIT, my, I kind of, I did an invisible education at MIT, you know, <laughs> like I was like an open researcher, just meeting professors, um, scholars. Well, I, I noticed your comments one, about um, um, Todd, uh, shoot. Macover, yes. Yeah, Todd yeah. Macover. I, yes. I, I, yes. Had, I had some collaboration with him at Interval back in the 90s, so I met him a few times. Oh, wow. Uh, but, Isn't that special? Yeah, he's an interesting fellow, and I got the chance to see his robot opera at the Dallas uh, Opera thing. He's he's always sort of integrated a lot of newer technology into his work, which is yes, yes. And I I think he's like um, like a figure that I follow. That that's nothing I do, but mm. it's uh, somebody who inspires me. You know, to watch his 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 range of understanding and knowledge is so vast that I'm always learning and I get triggered in my own journey, you know, which you could call uh, a journey of, of collages or sound art or a journey of the senses at random, uh-huh. you know? So it's, I, I just give in to the patterns of thoughts that don't necessarily have to be text or images or sounds. It just cut up and layered at random, you know? Uh-huh. Um, but, if I make uh, but one of your big inspirations is the scientific sources. It seems like. Yes. Yes. And it is very funny, um, Scott. I was writing those really stupid lyrics, you know, earlier after my, um, <laughs> after my birthday, because I was trying to meet up with what people wanted to hear. And, um, that was not me. That wasn't me. It wasn't until I came to MIT and until I met, met these professors and learned about the research from my perspective that I kind of opened up, you know, mm. to what could be possible, you know. So, um, like guys then would clear these texts over sounds, you know, and came to be, I guess, known as one of the founders of sound poetry. So, I felt liberated by this. You know, have, the, have, have you looked into uh, the machine learning and AI things that are happening with language? I mean, there's some... Uh, it's not coming to me right now, but there there is a a movement of people that are are letting like uh, machine learning uh, create poetry and that kind of stuff. Uh, yes. AI yes. weirdness. What's her name? Janelle Shannon, I think. She did the thing, very funny uh, posting about like this neural net that created these very strange paint colors, for example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but whenever I speak to people, either they really get me, like Todd gets me, you yeah, know, I, yeah, yeah. I've talked to him at length. Uh-huh. Todd really gets me. Uh, but there are some people like, uh, you know, I, I met so many professors, the professors who I met, I know they all got me, but there are people who don't get me, you know, and so I don't try to 
explain too much you know if they get me great if they don't get me it's fine i'm just weird i'm i'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah All so right. well so sound studies and liter- literary studies come together to me you know as i listen to or interpret music so how much how much is it important for the lyrics to be understood uh well let's see i mean well I don't know exactly what I'm asking. It's it's like uh, lyrics are important, but the music that carries the lyrics sometimes is more important than the lyrics. Yes. I'm thinking of the Pixies right, right. and the Breeders. There's certain bands that you can't really understand what they're saying, but you get the feeling. It comes across in the music anyway. Yes. Portishead is sometimes you, mumbling and, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I should send you the song that I wrote. You know, there, there are like 20, I would say, soundscapes that come with the book. That uh-huh. I created with the project. Well, I heard some and, of those. I mean, you shared some of that with me. So I, yes, yeah. I'm going to share some of those, and I think uh, some of those were okay, and yeah. some of them, them people could actually relate with people who didn't know anything about my work. Yeah, anything to do with what I do and how crazy I am. <laughs> they kind of like got the music as like, for example, the the song that I wrote on Lars's research. Right. You know. And it was based on, you know, um, it's uh, on the bumblebees, you know. And from there, I kind of like went to several spaces in my head, uh, unseen, dripping with rain and uh, magpies and um, the sun and the winds. And I ended up writing a song called I Wind, I Wish, you know. Mm -hmm. And Lars being a scientist, he's like, What's his title? What's I win? I wish. You know, what's that title? Well, <laughs> and then I had to explain it to him. Yeah. yeah and, and, and I kind of broke it down to him. Mm-hmm. And he's like, oh, my God, why did I make you deconstruct? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that so- song, I made um, a friend of mine, you know, she's also from MIT, but she's a, she's a data scientist. She has nothing to do with what I do. And I just told her to listen to it, you know. And she she said that I felt healed, you know, the songs. Oh. I don't know what she was singing in the lyrics. She couldn't understand the lyrics, um, and I didn't want her to understand the lyrics. I just wanted to hear the sounds, you know. If I was being able to um, make a prosodic connect with the sounds and the lyrics, you know, right? And and that's exactly what I wanted to. Because I was feeling healed as I was writing it, you know. It had a very romantic yet um, a very distant, um, you know, kind of like a memory trace in that song. So I, I thought it was a, a nice lyric, but she uh-huh. wasn't interested in the lyric. <laughs> she was like, I love the fact that you kind of changed the percussion, changed the rhythms went from one harmony to the other and i don't know where you went but wherever you went i went with it so oh, that's great well I'm, so for I, some reason I, I it, all the way through that. the conversation i keep thinking of a hundred years of sol- solitude you know uh, marquez's famous i mean i've only heard it in translation i didn't read the original spanish but it has the same sort of kind of like sense of the science but it also kind of a magical realism thing going on Exactly, exactly. That's how I could. I, I, I make it too long, and you made it in in short. I, <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. We try long. to keep these uh, little chats down to about thirty minutes, which is just about where we are. Uh-huh. So I think I'm going to uh, call this fully done, even though we just sort of touched on so many things. And, yes. Uh, I look forward to uh, talking to you more. So. Uh, this yes. Is, uh, so Ev- Ivana Muse uh, is uh, working at the fringes of the sound and data area by being inspired by science and creating new musical and sound art pieces that sound incredibly interesting. I'm going to definitely put a link to your SoundCloud stuff uh, in the description for the podcast. And uh, it's been really great talking to you. Thank you, Jordan. I'm learning a lot from you. Like most of what you said uh, didn't (laughs) 
get in my head, but I got traces <laughs> of information which I'm going to build a soundscape from. Oh, great! <laughs> well, well, I'll do the same then. We can sh- we can share soundscapes. I mean, I'm mostly working lately in using chess. I, I'm just in this situation where I have to. Are out. you serious? Well, I I did a that piece based on Reunion by uh, Cage and Duchamp. And oh wow! We're re- we're reiterating that piece, uh, but it's weird because it's part of the like Dallas Mavericks esports team, so it's like kind of all over the map. But anyway, enough about my thing. I'm I, I, I'm really fascinated by by your approach to all this stuff, and it's really great to get a chance to talk about. Uh, Thank you, Scott. I'm going to send you. I'm going to get to my email and send you the PDF of the book and a That's couple fantastic. of. Uh, and I yeah. and send a link so people can buy it if they if they're interested in, in uh, having a copy and stuff. I'm actually planning to release the book with the school, the starting of the Cambridge Creation Lab. Mm. So I'm trying to do that because the book is going to be a guiding factor in what I teach in the school. And what so what I'm is that? To... We haven't talked about the creative. What is that? The Cambridge uh, Creative. Yeah, so Cambridge Creation Lab. It's like. Yeah, it's like um, an online school that I'm thinking of starting. Ah. Like it's in the, in the works right now. Ah. So yeah, so I'm going to send you a, a you know a paper also that I just Roger told me to write, ah. and I just wrote it. You know, like a good schoolgirl, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm going to just um, finish um, making some some changes that he suggested. Okay, and. And format it better, and I'm going to send you the 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 paper that I wrote. What Cambridge Creation Lab is all about. Okay, so great. I think early yeah. early 2020, we should be starting the school, the online school. Sounds fantastic, and I'll you know, let's stay in touch about that. And as that develops, maybe we'll do another uh, uh, get together online here. Okay, that would be fantastic. Thank Very you nice. so much, Ivana. Thank you. Take care. Assess sound and data.